never ever put all your marketing eggs in one basket no matter how good it looks no matter how well it's working for you right now remember that it's not about you it's about your target audience so if you just focus on creating the best possible content for human readers i think you're already a step ahead of many competitors you don't have to reinvent the wheel but you do want to give your unique angle on something i think it's important to keep that in mind when you're trying to market yourself as a writer during the age of AI. Storytelling at the same time is very misunderstood in marketing. When it comes to website copy, this is what one of the mistakes I see the most. Hey there, real quick. If you enjoyed the show, please support by following on your favorite podcast station, review and share it with your peers to help them and me out because I don't run any ads and every share helps. Thanks and let's jump into it. Hey, welcome Jada. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you. Can you please tell our listener where are you calling from? Yes, of course. So I'm based in Chester, which is a tiny Roman town in the north of England. And what combination, a Roman town, you coming from Italy? <laughs> I know, it's all coming together. It was meant to be. <laughs> But how did you end up there? So when I moved to the UK, like a good 10 years ago, I actually started like by living in London. And then I went to university in Portsmouth in the south of England. Then I met my boyfriend there and when we finished our studies, we kind of figured out like the UK was our oyster. We could move wherever we wanted to, like start from scratch, look for like a job elsewhere. And originally I wanted to move to Liverpool because I thought I was need to find a job. So I need like somewhere that's got like a lot going on. So I was thinking more of a bigger city. My boyfriend was thinking of North, North Wales because he loves the outdoors and that kind of like biking, mountain biking and all that. Uh, but there's not a lot going on when it comes to marketing and jobs like over there. And as a compromise, we like looked on the map and saw that Chester was pretty much in between, like kind of like halfway between Liverpool and North Wales. So we thought we're going to go there as a compromise. And then we both fell in love with Chester. We've been here for four years. Wow. Yeah, that's going something to stay in one place, especially for me. Like I'm moving every single, yeah, not every single month, but three, four months moving to a new place. And uh, you mentioned at some point jobs. I know that currently you're a solopreneur, but before that, You were always in entrepreneurship or you had a full-time job at some point? I had a good old full-time job in the marketing department. And how did you make the transition? Why you changed that? Why you, you quit your job or you got fired or how did you end up into solopreneurship? Oh, that is a funny one. So when I finished university, I was I looked for a job like in marketing because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I thought I might like the social media side of things and because I used to be quite good at, at Instagram and all that before it was trying to be TikTok at least. And so I looked for like an apprenticeship to get started in the marketing world. And I actually ended up hating the social media side of things, but that is where I found out about copywriting and the writing side of things. So my apprenticeship was one year long, like one year contract, and it was me and another apprentice. And pretty much since the start, we were both told that there was gonna be a job offer for both of us at the end of our one year contract. So I was like, okay, like that, this is safe. It's fine. I don't have to worry about starting my business for a while because I had started freelancing on the side, but it was just like a very small side house, like small website. I didn't know what I was doing really back then. So I was planning on just taking the offer at the end of my apprenticeship and then maybe like build my business for like a couple of years and then consider quitting it and all that. But then basically one day, one month before the end of our apprenticeship, we received a very formal email telling us that there was just one job And we would have had to interview for it. So basically what we've been told wasn't actually what, what was happening. Like I, I remember feeling so shocked as well because it was it just came from an email. And this was like a fairly small business. It wasn't like a giant multinational company or anything like that. Like the office where the email came from was just next door. So I really took that as a sign. I was like, oh my God, like maybe the corporate world isn't as safe as it sounds. Like I, I, everyone telling you, you should stick to the safe job. And my family as well was telling me, oh, you should, some people in my family were like, oh, you should accept the safe job and just interview for it. But I was like, you know what? I'm a, I was already thinking of starting my business at some point. So I kind of took that as a sign and didn't apply. And then for some reason, I got offered a bit more money to stay. But you know, when I already made up my mind, I was like, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. I was already like going all in because I was feeling scared. But I was like, this is the sign I need to do it. So I quit. Well, quit. Let's say I didn't apply for the new job and then for the safe job, as my family was trying to tell me. And then a month after I left, my entire department got shut down and most of my colleagues made redundant, unfortunately. Well. Yeah. yeah, that's unfortunate for them. And in the same time, so 
wise for you because you anticipate that. And after you made that decision to not apply for that job, what were the next steps to transition to what you're doing now? So basically, I was already like doing it a little bit on the side. It was mainly like evenings and maybe like one day at the weekend. But obviously, when I knew that I wasn't going to take the job, I started to work a bit harder, like in my spare time to just get the first few clients. And I had one client at the time that was kind of asking me, oh, can you do a little bit more and all that? And obviously, I couldn't do that when I had the full-time job. But as soon as I knew that I was going to quit my full-time employment, I messaged and said, like, if you did, if you do need more from me, I'm going to be going full-time with my business. So like this, I give me a little bit more work to do. So that was really helpful. But at the same time, I started like reaching out to new people. So when I was first starting out, cold emailing was the main strategy for me because obviously my business, I, I didn't have a name uh, out there really. Like nobody knew that I existed, what kind of services I offered. So that even though it was really scary to like send these cold emails and either get ignored or sometimes get a harsh no or something like that, that's also how I got my first clients. So that's what I did to get started and start being, building a name for myself. And getting actually getting the first clients. But at the same time, I also started investing like in my own marketing and content marketing, because obviously that is more of a long term game. But the sooner the earlier you start, the sooner you're gonna see some results. So those were the two things. Starting with content marketing for like a long term, more sustainable strategy, but cold emailing to get the first results as soon as possible. And how many cold emails did you send before getting that first one? Oh, like I, I just somewhere in my on my computer, I still have the file, like the log of all the emails. So like there is like a specific answer somewhere, like buried up into, deep into my computer. But I would say probably like we're talking like dozens of emails before getting the first reply. And the first reply was a no. But I remember that it was harsh, but at the same time, it was good for me to know that someone was reading those emails and, you know, even a negative reply is better than no reply at all sometimes because at least you know what to expect. And I think after a few dozens emails, maybe like, I want to say between close to 30, something like that, potentially, then I got my first client via cold emails and then I got a couple more after it, it, it kind of like it started coming together after the first one. I think maybe like it helped a little bit more with my confidence. So I was like sounding a bit more confident in the actual email and that helped a bit more because at first I was, you could probably tell even if it was just like written down, like you could probably tell that I wasn't that confident about it because I was like going at it from a place of scarcity almost because I knew that I didn't have a job and I needed like client work. And then after that, it it came for like a better sounding kind of proposition. Like I can do this for your business. And it, yeah, it's like attracting better client after that. Awesome. And uh, even that you started with cold email, you were already working on a long-term strategy, which is mm -hmm. to rely on inbound rather than outbound. Yeah. And with that part of the strategy, how long did it take until you start getting results? Well, it took a while, mainly because at first I wasn't really clear on like what I wanted to do with my business. At first I was just like a generic writer and I was doing all kinds of writing. So that kind of worked against me because obviously with content marketing and inbound marketing, it works if you're putting out the right content for your specific audience. And back then I didn't really know who, my, who I was talking to read. I was talking to everyone basically because I was still trying to find my own niche in the copywriting world. So that's why it probably took a bit longer than normally would. Probably I would say a year to get good results. And normally it can take as little as, when it comes to SEO, for example, it can take as little as like six months to see the first good traffic and relevant traffic. But yeah, because I was like kind of like putting up stuff that was a bit all over the place to begin with, it took a bit longer. But yeah, it definitely paid off. Yeah, for sure. That's the good part about long-term strategies. It takes time, but when you compound and start to get results, it can be a never-ending lead generation machine. But before jumping into this, can you please tell me more about how you managed to get from a place or where you didn't have an idea about your ideal client, about who you want to work with, until you find those clients that you enjoy working with and try to actually narrow down the path? Yes, of course. So I think what was holding me back was like the idea that is very popular in the copywriting world that as a copywriter, you need to niche down based on a specific industry. So you can either be like a, a health content writer or a software as a service copywriter. And what I like the most about my job is like the variety of the kind of things I get to write about, the kind of businesses I get to collaborate with. So I didn't really want to niche down and put myself in a box when it came to like a specific industry and always writing about a specific type kind of topics. So that's why I kind of resisted niching for the first couple of years in business. 
And it was only like by writing about different topics and collaborating with different types of businesses that I realized that I was mainly attracting female solopreneurs anyway. And we were like working pretty well together with like most of them at least. And that's when I started to get a bit more involved, like on LinkedIn and like talking to other business owners and getting more involved, like different communities. And that's where I opened my eyes to like how difficult it still is for like women in business to be taken seriously, to be seen as an actual confident CEOs rather than like all the gender bias that is still like floating around. And most people, when you tell them like to picture a CEO, most of them will still picture a man in most cases. And I thought that made me realize that like maybe with my work, that's what I could do. Like I was already attracting this type of audience anyway. And if I niche down, like by working mainly with that specific audience, maybe I could make a difference for these businesses and help them help female founded businesses reach more people and have their name out there and all that. So that it kind of happened. I didn't really look for it, but all these things happened at once made me realize actually my niche doesn't have to be a specific industry. It can be a specific target audience and it can also be a specific type of copy because at the moment I'm mainly like doing website copy and blog content writing services so basically all the kind of words that you have on a website rather than trying to do social media and newsletter and all these kind of things yeah I niche down by that instead. I think that's a really smart approach since instead of writing for every single piece of media that's out there it's hard. The content is so different. It's so, it needs to be in a certain style to achieve a certain goal, but focusing only on website copy and blogs and for a specific type, even that it's not a market, but it's quite specific still. I totally agree with you that there are many ways to narrow down audience. It doesn't Absolutely. have to be a market, doesn't have to be like specific type of service or whatever. And After you did this change, what happens to your approach? Do you still do outreach or you start relying only on inbound? So I've stopped doing cold outreach for like, I would say maybe a year. So yeah, at the moment I'm relying on inbound marketing and that comes from my own website. So the copy that I've written for my own website and my own blog, I I practice what I preach. I still update my blog. The same things I tell my clients to do, I do as well for myself because that is what's bringing me results. And I mainly post on LinkedIn and then I've got my newsletter. So I put out a lot of content and at the moment, yeah, it's been inbound marketing for a while, which I personally prefer. But as I said before, it's a long-term strategy. So like what, if someone is getting started, if someone's listening to this and just getting started, yeah, you can't just rely on that for the first few months. It's going to take some time to really get the first results. But after a while, I think it's just nicer to have people come to you rather than having to, because cold outreach is time consuming as well and take some time to, you don't want to send like just a generic email. You want to take the time to look at the business and send them something valuable. So it's quite time consuming. So I personally prefer inbound marketing as a strategy. Yeah, definitely. And especially when you just start out, but even that you start outreaching, you already applying what you preach and already working for a long-term strategy. And now having basically three sources of leads, newsletter, LinkedIn and website. Yeah, one dries out, you have still the other two and so on. And And as I always say, like never, ever put all your marketing eggs in one basket, no matter how good it looks, no matter how well it's working for you right now, never, ever put them all in one basket because you never know. know? Like, especially social media is quite unpredictable. The algorithm can change. And so many people are getting banned on LinkedIn for like absolutely no reason at the moment. So you, you It's good to have a LinkedIn profile. It's good to be consistent with it. But if you are putting everything, relying just on that lead generation system alone, the small change is going to affect your business really bad. And it could be the same with Google. You know, SEO is good for you, but then maybe there's a bit of an algorithm update. And if that's all you're relying on, that will affect you as well. So absolutely, like, I think three strategies is a good one to not spread yourself too thin, but at the same time, feel a bit more secure when it comes to your lead generation. We never know and we need to adapt. And speaking of adaptation, for those that are new to content marketing and new on creating content, what would be your advice? How should they start, especially for those that have zero experience with content? So the most important thing with content marketing is to create content for your audience, which sounds basic, but it isn't really because it's so easy, especially if it's your business, if you're a solopreneur, you are the business. So it's so tempting to just like write about what you want to write about and start 
saying things like, oh, I'm really excited to announce that I got nominated for this, or like, I'm so delighted to tell you that this is happening in my business. But in reality, content marketing is about creating the best possible content for your specific audience. And it's about creating content that can help them solve some kind of pain point, answer a question that they have. Of course, it needs to be related to your industry, to your niche, or like to the type of services or products that you offer, but it should still be about them rather than you. So the first thing about starting a content marketing strategy is remember that it's not about you, it's about your target audience and you need to create the best possible content for them specifically. So that means that you're not going to compete with websites that are maybe like much bigger than yours. They've been doing this for like many years and they are targeting, say, like multinational companies. If you are writing about similar topics but are writing for a different audience, maybe like there could be a small solopreneur running their own business, of course, you're not going to compete against the giants, but you could, you should still aim to get the best possible content for them specifically by targeting where they are right now in the buyer's journey compared to the sales fund and all that so make it about them and it's also important to be consistent so i would say especially if you're a solopreneur obviously you won't be able to do everything when it comes to content you need to be strategic because you won't be able to have a a podcast and a youtube channel and a blog and and a newsletter and all that you need to choose two or three channels to focus all of your most of your efforts on when it comes to content marketing because otherwise you're going to spread yourself too thin. And consistency doesn't have to mean doing something every day, putting a piece of content out every day. If you can commit to doing that consistently and creating high quality content, great, you do you. But it's much better to just post maybe like twice on social media every week, but putting out like high quality posts. It's better to have one monthly blog post that is like actually insightful and written specifically for your audience rather than just like say four blog posts a month that are just like written out in a rush just to put something out there. So the second thing I would say consistency and quality over quantity when it comes to content. And yeah, it's really about making time for it as well, because especially if you're providing services for other business owners, it's so easy to obviously, you do need to prioritize client work, but I hear it from like so many writers that they say, I never have time to upload my own blog. I never have time to write for my own LinkedIn. I haven't emailed my newsletter in a month. And if you wait until you're going to magically remember about it, you are never going to do it. So what I do for myself is like, I block specific say like an afternoon or like a morning like in my diary every for example every month for my blog every couple of weeks for to create a bunch of newsletters but it's it is specifically in my diary and while I can maybe be slightly flexible with it if like one day I really I'm just so busy I can't do it but if I can't do it that day I will move it in the diary and do it the next day because otherwise you're never gonna find time to do it so third thing I would say I actually lost count I think this is the third tip if not maybe you can edit it out (laughs) but yeah my (laughs) Final thing would be, yeah, make time for it because otherwise you're going to forget. Indeed. And if we, I were the same way, like if I don't block it in the calendar, if I don't have it there, it's completely forgotten. Absolutely. It's just, it's not easy to run a business and create our own content if you don't have a system for it. So you need to make it as easy as possible for yourself. Yeah. And as low friction as possible, it will get the things done. And when it comes to content, you're specialized on the blog part of things and how that works in terms of inbound. How do you specifically create content to convert those viewers into leads? So it starts by thinking about the sales funnel because your website copy is mainly for people who are towards the very end, the very bottom of the funnel. They're already looking for a specific type of service or products because they know that they want to buy it or they like need help with this figuring out whether they're going to buy it from you or one of your competitors, right? But that is like such a small percentage of your audience. That's like usually like 5%. And if you're not blogging, you're basically missing out on like 95% of your audience who's still like, he's already Googling stuff, but he's not Googling the kind of like keywords that are from the bottom of the funnel. They're like trying to figure out what they need in the first place. So when you're blogging, like to start generating leads, it's important to begin by asking yourself, what does my audience need to know when it comes to my type of industry, when it comes to my type of services, like what is the main problem right now? And what are they Googling in order to figure out how to solve it? And obviously that won't be the biggest problem, the one that you can solve with the actual product or or service, but it will be something that will take them there because, you know, they figure out that, for example, it could be that the website is not ranking on Google. So they don't know whether they need to invest in an SEO company or in a new website or in a copywriter, but they know that their website is not showing up on Google. So that might be one of the first things that they're like trying to solve by typing it on Google itself. So obviously you want to figure out where your target audience is at this stage 
and you want to create content that is like for the top of the funnel and middle of the funnel, especially there are blog posts that can work for like bottom of the funnel too. But I think the main ones is to just start at the top and help them move down towards the bottom. Obviously you need to do keyword research because you can't rely on just guesswork just because you think they might be Googling something. It might not necessarily be what they're actually typing, or they might not be typing it in the way that you would type it as a professional business owner in that industry. So you need to figure out what your audience is actually looking for. And of course, you create the blog post for them, you optimize them for SEO, but at the same time, you want to spread them around the web, like using like social media, your newsletter as well, because again, you don't want to realize just on one strategy. And then you want to make sure that there is some kind of call to action, usually at the end of the blog post that tells this person what they should do next. And of course, if we're talking about top of the funnel, they might not be ready, probably not ready to invest in your service just yet. But the call to action could be maybe if you've shared some kind of informational, educational blog post, call to action could be to subscribe to your newsletter to get more insights and advice on the same kind of topic. Or it could be to download a lead magnet that expands on something that you've covered in the blog post. So basically the goal of the of every blog is not to make a sale, which is why it's quite hard to kind of like measure sometimes the, res- the, the results that you get from content marketing, because it's not, you don't get a sale from the first blog post that you're going to put out, but it's more about getting them to move down the funnel and smoothening as much as possible by retaining some of those readers and turning them into subscribers, into social media followers. And then eventually, once they're actually ready to invest in the final product or services, you're going to be the first one they're going to think of. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's a really good dive into blogging. And going back on what you talked about, can you please expand a bit on the keyword research part, since it's such an important topic and Mm -hmm. something that most of those creating content don't rely on? Do you have any particular approaches or tools that you use in order to achieve that? And how do you start the approach? So I would say if you're a complete beginner, start with like Google's own keyword research tool, which is Google's Keyword Planner. And you can use that for free. Um, if I remember correctly, because I set it up many years ago, you do need to create a Google Ads account and create an ad and pretend that you're running an ad, but you can pause it and you don't have to pay any kind of money to use it. And I think if you're just starting out, that would that is the best option because it's very basic and it's not what I rely on to create your friendly blog posts for my client. But if you're just trying to figure out how keyword research works, obviously that's free and you can just spend as much time as you want to try and play with it. Some other ones that I use, for example, are Uber Suggest, and I don't actually know how to pronounce it, but H A H R E F. How would you pronounce that? <laughs> it's like the Hrefs. Yeah. Hrefs. So bad. I've been using them for years, and I don't actually know how to pronounce them. <laughs> but yeah, that is another good one. And then there's one called Long Tail Keyword Pro, I think, and that's for long tail keywords. So very useful for blog posts. But yeah, I would say start with the free one, familiarize yourself with it, and what you want to do is basically just like When you have an idea for a blog post, you start typing a few potential keywords that you think, let's say you're writing a blog post on, you you know what, you give me a topic and I'll try and come up with the keyword (laughs) because like my mind is blank right now. (laughs) (laughs) No worries. Yeah. Let's say uh, finding clients as a freelancer. As, As a freelancer, you said? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you're obviously a freelancer. You want to find out how to find clients and you're probably going to type where to find clients or how to find clients and then even better where to find clients as a freelancer so what you can do is go on like one of these keyword research tools and type a few different options and then they will show you which ones get searched the most and which ones don't really get searched because it could be that as i said before like you might think oh i'm sure they're going to type it this way but actually the person is not a specialist in a specific area they're going to type it slightly different so what this like the keyword research tool we show you is like what is the one that is most likely to be typed by your specific audience and then when you have that what you also want to do is search google the keyword yourself and you see what kind of results come up for that keyword because you don't want to just optimize your blog post for a good keyword if it doesn't match the type of content that you're creating around it because another thing that is very important when it comes to content marketing and blogging as well is that you want to match the search intent behind the keyword. So that means that whenever someone types a keyword, they're expecting some type of content, which could be a sales page if if you think they're ready to buy. It could be an informational blog post. So you want to make sure that the keyword you're targeting is the right keyword for an informational blog post if that's what you're trying to, you're planning on writing. So look at the top results for that keyword and see if that kind of matches the, the type of blog post that you are planning on writing. Obviously, with keyword research, it gets really technical because it's not just about how many times it's searched every month. It's also about how competitive the keyword is. So if a keyword 
get searched a lot, but it's also really competitive, it's going to be unlikely that you're going to show up on the first page of Google for it. So in some cases, it might make more sense to choose a keyword that is not the most popular, but it's also not the most, the hardest to rank for. So you kind of have to compromise. So there is a lot of like work that goes into it behind the scene to figure out what the best keyword for you is. But I think as a beginner, it's just like handy to start with a free tool and see like what kind of, what language your, your audience is using and have a look at what other people are putting out there. And there, my advice is always to like look at other people's blog posts and try to make yours the best possible one out there but not just in general, just the best specific one for your specific audience, because it might be that some other blog posts are better suited for, like, say, a different kind of niche, a different type of market. And you just want to make sure that yours is just speaking to your specific audience. And again, obviously, it starts with the keyword, but I always tell my clients, my followers that you need to write, you're still writing for humans, even though it's SEO, you're never writing for a machine. Like it should always be human first, which is why I think SEO gets a lot of bad reputation because many agencies and writers are just writing for search engines. But in reality, yeah, you're like using search engines to help humans find your content. You're not writing for the machine, basically. Indeed. And especially with the last year update, algorithm updates with the helpful content, this is more important than ever. Absolutely. And if you just push out content, especially now with all the AI tools that help with this, it will be a lot of noise. And those that are just pushing masses of content for the simple fact that they want to be out there, they won't stand out simply because no, absolutely. just noise. And uh, I want to challenge you here on something. Let's say that someone wrote a blog article and mm -hmm. it didn't do well literally like everyone like most people that arrive on the page bounce basically non-technically speaking leave the page and how do you go about it you will simply delete that article to not affect the whole domain or what would be the steps that person have to take in order to solve the problem I don't think you should delete it. I think you should just improve it and see what isn't, what, what's working, why it's actually not working. So it could be as simple as the fact that you maybe you've used the wrong keyword to begin with. And so you're attracting the wrong type of audience. So what I would do is obviously conduct some more keyword research again and figure out if I've used the best keyword for that blog post. Does the keyword actually describe the focus of the blog post? I would also look at the title and the meta description, which is what this is the first thing that people can see when they're conducting some keyword research. And again, that sounds like a fancy term, but that's just literally what you see when you Google something and you see the title and you see the meta description. If this is too technical, but Google doesn't always show the meta description that you provided, but you know, you, you still want to give them the best possible option just in case they do. So I would look at that to see like, is it actually speaking to the right audience? Is it like setting the right premise? Am I setting the right expectations for this blog post? Because it might be that that's the main problem why it's not ranking, because it's not ranking, sorry, why it's not attracting the right audience. It might be speaking to the wrong, to the wrong niche, the wrong target market. And then I would like look at the actual blog post itself. So a blog post, a good blog post should have like a bit of an introduction that again, sets the right expectations and tells people what they can expect. Maybe like it connects with their current pain point, reminds them of why it's important to find an answer to this specific question. So like stirs the pain point a little bit and then tells them, teases what people can expect from this blog post. And then the core of the actual article should obviously expand on that, but always stay true to the promise. And I think if some people are leaving the website too soon it could possibly be that's the problem like the the actual blog post doesn't describe the the focus of the actual keyword so people are going on there hoping to find an answer to something and they're not actually they're not actually finding it in the blog post and that's why they're leaving and then at the end obviously you want to have a conclusion that kind of wraps it all up so i would actually spend more time in editing the blog post and seeing what's wrong rather than just deleting it or another thing you could do is to look at your competitor's blog post for that same keyword, see what else is on Google's first page and see what they're doing differently. Maybe they're talking about a specific type of subtopic that you completely overlooked in your blog post and that might be more relevant to your actual audience when it comes to that keyword. So it's all about like spending time to see why it didn't work and what you can do to improve it because you know, I think deleting is a bit drastic and it could be that there is an easy solution for this problem. And of course, it's just, if you've done all these and you realize that just, yeah, you completely missed the mark with that blog post, then of course you can delete it. But there's so many more things that you can do before that, rather than going for the most drastic and dramatic decision. 
<laughs> yeah, I love that advice. And indeed, that's definitely better to try to improve before deleting. Uh, apart from the cure research, what other tips do you have for those trying to optimize their pages? I'm thinking here about amount of content on the page, number of words, or what other things that are still relevant because I know that things change a lot. So. Yeah, that's the thing. Like things change, but the core SEO, I think in my opinion, stays the same. You want to create the best possible content for human readers. And I think Google is getting smarter and smarter when it comes to understanding what the best content is. So if you keep doing that, regardless of all the algorithm updates, because you're never going to stay on track of all the updates because they, they do like hundreds of updates every year. So if you just focus on creating the best possible content for human readers, I think you're already a step ahead of many competitors. But what you can do is obviously create a blog post that answers the specific question and it doesn't make your audience feel like oh I was expecting something and now I'm getting something else entirely so you want to stay true to your initial promise use the right keyword and then you want to use the keyword multiple times within the actual page but again it's not about making it robotic and using the keyword every other sentence or so you want to do it like as organically as possible so for example you want to use it at the start of your blog post, usually the first 100 words or so, you want to use it in your headings a few times. You want to use it in the actual text, but it's no longer as strict as it used to be because it used to be a specific percentage of keyword density and all those kind of like technical percentages. And I think what I see like Google is no longer worrying about that as much. It's about using it a few times just to help Google understand what the article is about. You want to use it in your the text on your images. You want to use it in some hyperlinks if possible. So if you're like including a link to like some kind of stats or something relevant, if you can use the keyword to highlight the actual text, that will help with your SEO. You want to use it towards the very end of the blog post and you don't want to just use the exact same keyword over and over again. Sometimes you want to include some kind of like similar keywords. For example, we talked about how to make tea, but you also want to say how to brew tea. So similar things like that, that not only like gives more context to Google, but it's also less repetitive for your human readers to read, to find that kind of keyword in the text. And if possible, you also want to add like keywords that are related to that specific industry, the specific niche, specific type of topic that you've tackled in the actual blog post, even though it's not the main keywords you want to rank for, that's just going to help Google understand what your article is about. So it's more like about giving, giving it a bit more context so that it can understand, okay, maybe this keyword is used for different types of industry, but this blog post is only talking about this specific one. So I'm going to show it to people who are interested in that type of subtopic, basically. And when it comes to keeping track of this. Do you use any tools to help you? Oh, I use this keyword this amount of time and the variation of it multiple times. Is that Ahrefs or you use other tool to see how many times you use a keyword in a specific article? So I personally don't do that. I personally like do it like actually as a human looking at how many times I've used it myself rather than like relying on keyword density because I found that I think if you're especially as a beginner it can be helpful to use plugins and stuff like Yoast SEO I think obviously it can help if you're getting started but I think once you've been doing that for a while it becomes a bit more organic you see like where the keywords is and I don't recommend getting too hyper fixated on exactly how many times you've used it because sometimes it could actually be that you've used let's say like the keyword is plural so it ends with an s and you've used it as a singular keyword a few times, sometimes these tools can't actually detect it. So they'll tell you, oh, you haven't used the keyword enough in the first hundred words, you need to add it. But in reality, you have used it. It's just that you used like a slightly different version. And as I said, Google is getting smarter and smarter when it comes to identifying these kind of things. Like it, Google will understand that it's the same keyword, but some tools can be a bit funny about that. So I personally don't rely on those. But as I said, like if someone doesn't feel as confident or just starting out, I can see why they could be potentially be helpful in trying to get used to how many times roughly you should have your keyword in the text. But as I said, take them with a pinch of salt because it's still AI at the end of the day. Yeah, true. And speaking of AI, what's your take on it, especially when it comes to content creation for blogs and do you rely on it in some ways or how you leverage it or what's your take on the future of content writing? So I, I definitely think that AI is going to impact content writing. I personally don't rely on it because I think what helps my blog post stand out and the kind of blog posts that I write for my clients is that we are putting out like content that stands out, that is different from what is already on there. And that's why I 
get my clients to give me some pointers and I position them as thought leaders. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I were just to like choose a keyword and tell AI to write about it, because what you get is really a mix, like a bit of a mixture of what is already on internet or for that keyword. And what I want to do for my clients is get them to tell me like about their point of view on a topic and so that I can spin the right words for it and help put out something that is like quite unique and you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you do want to give some kind of some unique advice and some your unique angle on something. For me, like what takes the longest time when it comes to content creation is actually the research behind an article rather than the writing itself. The writing isn't that hard at all. It's all the research that comes beforehand that is what is time consuming because it's not just about learning more of, about a topic. It's about finding the right perspective, the right angle for your specific target client and to move them from A to B with that specific blog post. So I personally don't rely on AI. And I'm happy that way because there's a lot of my work is about strategy and what goes on behind the scenes as well. Like, so it's not just about a blog post per se, but it's about how they all work together and how we can move people on the funnel and what we wanted to do after that. But I can totally see that AI will penalize some writers, for example, if someone is just used to writing, say, offering like a thousand words for 10 pounds on Fiverr. Yeah, this person's job will probably be taken by AI. So I think it will definitely penalize some writers because if you're just writing words, if that's your angle, if that's your selling point that you write words, AI can do that for you. So I can definitely see like making a negative impact on the business or like the freelancing side of things for like many writers. But if what you're doing is about strategy and more than just the words. You're not just putting out words, but you're, you have a strategy behind them and you want these words to actually get the person to do something after they've written, the, after they've read them. Then I don't think AI is as good as humans when it comes to that. Or at least not yeah. yet. We'll see. Uh, at least not yet. Yeah, it's true. And that's the perspective that I like. The fact that you don't rely on executing only. You have that strategy part, the thinking part, which thinking probably at some point AI will be able to replace that as well. But as things stand, being paid for thinking, being paid for strategizing and not just output, it's a huge differentiator when it comes to being a self-employed. Even for those that have a full-time job, if your job is to move things from A to B or to fill a spreadsheet or to copy text from here to there, that will be easy replaceable by an automatician or something. Absolutely. But if you are being paid to strategize things, to be paid to make more money for that specific, I don't know, business owner or client, you're in a good position and you're still far away from being replaced. And here on this point, what will be your take on those that are in that position, that are still relying on output rather than thinking? How do you advise them to move from that box and move into the being paid for strategy and thinking? Since I believe there is a lot of limiting beliefs there and a lot of mindset thing that needs to be changed. What would be your take on it in order to be able to move from the A to B? So from a mindset point of view, I think you need to stop seeing yourself as an employee, which I know like these people are freelancers, but they are very much approaching these kind of jobs as an employee. Like on Fiverr, you're like pitching your services and like hoping to get a gig and it's, you're still relying on this other person to choose you amongst all these kinds of writers. So it helps to like start thinking of yourself as a business owner and actually build a brand for yourself. So don't just rely on these platforms and actually have your own website, post on LinkedIn or like whatever social media platform is most useful to your specific audience, but like try and have a personal brand and think of it more as a business rather than just, yeah, I like offer writing services on Fiverr because there's already a lot of competition on those websites anyway. And right now, like AI can do pretty much the same. So if you're just used to like scraping the web for all this kind of information without any kind of input from your clients, without any kind of strategy, then yes, AI is already doing that. So it's going to be really hard. So what I recommend is obviously start thinking of yourself as a business and try and find some kind of niche, which as we said before, it doesn't have to be about a specific industry it can be about it can be anything you want but it, you do need to have something that kind of differentiates you from the other writers out there and from ai itself because it's not just about putting the blog post up there and then expecting them to magically work of course some of them will gain traction organically on google but you need to get 
tell the client how to promote them, tell them like how to sh share them on social media, how to share them in newsletter. So like you want to start selling like this type of service rather than just saying, I write X amount of words for $10 or whatever, because that is what is going to be still very valuable for business owners. Have someone who can take care of the blogging side of things and is not just, and or content, depending on what you specialize in, but it's not just about a standalone piece of content. It's part of a bigger strategy and it should all come together. But you won't be able to do that if you're thinking about it as like standalone pieces that you just get AI or all kinds of different writers on Fiverr to do. So you want to start marketing yourself that way and speak to the how this is going to, what kind of difference it's going to make for the actual business owner once they invest in a strategy rather than just a bunch of words every month or something like that. Indeed, because it's all that matter to them. Like what results can you bring to them? How you can save them either money or make them more money or save them time and so on. doesn't matter how many pieces of content can you produce and such. They don't care or what tools do you use or whatever. Exactly. But I think even saving time is another dangerous one. I think it used to be a selling point as a writer. You can tell people you're saving them time. But again, now AI can do that for the business owner. Like AI can save them even more time. So I think it's important to keep that in mind when you're trying to market yourself as a writer during the age of AI. You're not just saving them time. You're bringing them results. You're giving them content that is going to make an actual difference. It's going to smoothen the funnel. It's going to give them additional content for the other channels like social media and your newsletter. It's going to make it easier to sell their services because people are already educated on the subject. And, you know, it's going to give them more newsletter subscribers because you're going to have that call to action at the bottom. So while saving time used to be a big one, and I made the mistake myself when I started out, I used to market myself that way. Like I'm going to save you a lot of time. I think right now AI can do that for them. So you don't want to rely on that. You want to rely on the kind of difference you're making for them that they're not going to get from the AI tool. Awesome. And you mentioned something there, marketing myself. And I know that you're quite a bit into brand story mm -hmm. and storytelling and such. Can you expand a bit on that? And how did you realize that this is something that you love doing? Yeah, I think so. the book that changed my view on marketing and storytelling for like marketing purposes is actually building a story brand. And I recommend, whenever someone asks me, like, what is a business book that I recommend, that is always at the top of the list for me. And I think storytelling really works in marketing. And that's not just me saying it. it's like scientifically, we are, we remember things more easily if they're part of the story. When we hear or read some kind of story, it generally releases certain chemicals in our brain that make it easier for us to remember certain facts, make it easier for us to remember, in our case, a brand that's telling this kind of story. So it's scientifically proven that storytelling works and helps you be remembered, helps you like make a connection because that is another important thing is the empathy side of things. You are going to make a connection with your audience. So storytelling at the same time is very misunderstood in marketing because like lots of people think they're telling the right stories, but in reality, they are only talking about themselves and they think that they are the hero of the story that they're telling. In reality, if you, of course, I like, don't get me wrong, you still want to tell your customers a little bit about your background because it's going to make a connection and it's going to build your personal brand and all that. But when it comes to the actual conversion focused copy on your web, so when you're trying to actually sell your services, the story that you need to tell isn't about how you are the hero of the story. The hero of the story should always be your target audience. So you want to talk about their current pain point and you know why it's making their life more difficult and what you can do to help them solve it. So in reality, people sometimes think that as a business owner, they are the hero of the story. But in reality, we are like the trusted guide, the, the helper. We are not Cinderella. We are the fairy godmother. We are not Luke Skywalker. We're Obi-Wan Kenobi, which is still a cool part. But you just need to own it, understand that you are there and your story is there to show the heroes or your audience how they can get to their happy ending and why they should choose you as the best possible guide to have their problem solved and achieve this happy ending. So the storytelling side of things is also about painting a picture of how that transformation will look and feel like in the dream audience's eyes, you know, how like the strong contrast between the initial situation and how good or empowered or relaxed they'll feel, depending on what you sell, after they've actually invested in your business and service. But if you really want to actually make that sale and get people to fall in love with your brand and understand how you can help them and actually remember this, you need to tell a story that puts the audience at the actual, make, paints the audience as the hero of this story. Yeah, I love that. And as relatable as possible for them, it will be as successful as possible for you. It is no other way around. And uh, moving on to you, 
because you provide a lot of value, a lot of tips, a lot of things. But you mentioned something nice there that you're also a writer on the side. You're yeah. writing something currently? So I've just released a poetry pamphlet. It came out literally last week. It was published by a small poetry press in America. So yeah, that is my latest project. And after that, there was a lot of work behind the scenes. So I'm taking a bit of a break from bigger writing projects, but it's my dream to actually write a novel, get it published and see it in a bookstore. Like that is the dream of a lifetime. Hopefully one day. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. You're super talented. So I'm following your content on LinkedIn and I know how good you write. So I'm pretty sure that will be the case that you be able to materialize that dream. And congratulations on the launch. Um, Thank you. It's also available online for people to yes. download. It's called Ghost Hometowns and you can find it on Amazon and all kinds of book retailers. Awesome. Or, I'll, or share online the, book retailers. I'll share the links as well in the show notes. Uh, speaking of links, if someone wants to work with you, how they can find you? So the name of my business is Crafty Copy and you can find me at craftycopy.co.uk and obviously I'm very active on LinkedIn and obviously you can join my newsletter. But I think, yeah, craftycopy.co.uk is the best place to start because you get a bit of an overview of the type of services that I offer. I've launched a new offer only. Actually, that was every, everything happened in one week. I launched my new, <laughs> the big offer for my business and the book launch happened to be on the same week. So it was a lot of like, a lot of caffeine went on behind the scenes to make all that happen in one go. Oh, that's quite something you need in a, such a short time span to be able to do so many things. I'll put all those links into the show notes for those interested. And to wrap up things, this time you will have to create a challenge for our audience, a 24 hour challenge. That's not sure if you have something in mind for them, something that can be easy to apply and at the same time practical for those that have no experience with copywriting. Okay, there is something that you, you said 24 hours, as in like something they can do in 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, one thing when it comes to website copy, this is one of the mistakes I see the most. So my challenge is to fix it if that is also a mistake on your website. So when someone lands on your website, they will see what they see. Everything they see before scrolling down is called above the fold content. And you want that, the copy on there to give the, give, make people think, okay, I'm in the right place. And this person can give me, tell me something that I'm interested in and it's going to solve my problem. The problem I encounter the most is that people like, sometimes they don't even have any kind of copy. They're just maybe like a good picture. That's great. But like, it's, if, you ha if you haven't got any copy, you're really missing out. You know, you might be driving your audience away because they think, well, I don't know, you know, what this business is about. And they're not up for spending hours trying to, well, I'm saying hours, minutes and seconds is actually like hours in internet time. If people don't find a solution and an answer within a few seconds, they're going to leave your website. Or maybe they do have some copy like in that top section, but it's very like vague and not, it doesn't clarify what this business is actually about. So my challenge for you is to actually create a tiny bit of copy for the top section of your website that is actually going to make your audience feel like they're in the right place and they want to find out more about your business. So how you can do that, you want to have, obviously you're going to have a headline and a tiny bit of explainer copy underneath the headline. So what you can do, and it will take some time to brainstorm this. So like, don't think that you're going to have to, you're not going to get to the final sentences in a couple of minutes. You're going to have to reword them and play with different things. But what you definitely want to include in that is like, specify exactly what type of business owner, what type of business you are, or like what you do. So like be as clear as possible. You want to tell them who you're targeting, like who is this for, like what type of audience. And you don't necessarily have to tell them, I am a graphic designer for solopreneurs. Of course, if that's where you are, that's going to be very easy for them to understand. But it could be that you tell them like a bit more like subtly. So it could be, I help time poor solopreneurs. So like someone that, you know, hasn't got time to look after their own graphic elements and all that. So you can play around with it as long as it makes that specific audience think, okay, this is about me. Then the third thing you want to include is like, how does this benefit them? Why should they care? Because it's not enough to tell them that what you are and what you do and who for, you need to also show them that these should actually matter to them. Like, how is it going to make a difference for the business? Why should they take some time out of their busy life to find out more about you and, you know, about what you can do for them? And then once you've got this, like, play with it and, like, try and, like, make it as clear as possible. And my advice here is to, like, prioritize clarity over trying to sound clever and fancy and playful some people like miss out on clarity because they're trying to create some kind of puns or some kind of wordplay and if you can do both at the same time that's great but if you have to sacrifice clarity 
it's never going to be worth it because you're going to, some people are just going to disconnect and switch off and leave your website. So you want to make sure that you include these points. So who you are or what you do, who for and why they should care about it. And then another thing that you can add to that top section, once you've got the copy correct, like written down and like perfect and polished, you also want to tell them what they should do next. So have some kind of call to action button on that top section of your website. Because of course, more people will need, usually people will need to find out a bit more and like read the rest of your copy. But if, if say someone has just landed on there because they've already been following you on LinkedIn or like they just want to get started, you need to make it as easy as possible for them to actually get started straight away. So you want to have a call to action button that is maybe like it links to your top service, a button to actually, a form to actually book a call with you or something that's just help people get started and tell them exactly what to do. And if you can, you also want to add another button that is not as attention grabbing, not as flashy, but it's just there as an option for people who want to find out more about you, but they're not quite ready to invest just yet. So it could be about joining your newsletter, downloading your lead magnet, or like looking at your portfolio, just something to help them move down the funnel a little bit, even if they're not ready to buy just yet. And once you've got that and you've got like a very clear headline and explainer copy and some call to action buttons, your website is going to be already ahead of most of your competitors in most cases, especially if you're a solopreneur, because I see many solopreneurs websites that are a bit all over the place when it comes to this. But if you have your core messaging and the, you know, the first few sections of your copy on point, you're already going to be setting yourself up for success when it comes to getting people to stay on your website and read more about what you do. So that's my 24 hour challenge for you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thanks so much for all the wonderful advice and technical things that you shared that are really useful. And I know that those that are taking notes and start applying and leverage content marketing for them will be huge. It's a really good long-term strategy and one that can lead you to really great source of leads. So take that into consideration moving forward. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jada. It was a great to have you in the show. Thank you for and can't wait to see your dream come true and see your book in the store. Thank you so much. It's lovely to finally meet you after being connected for so long as well on LinkedIn. Likewise. Thanks for listening, everybody. Make sure to check the show notes where you'll find direct links to the tools and resources mentioned in this episode and much more. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to subscribe to your favorite podcast station to not miss when we drop the next one. We have lots of exciting guests and surprises for you coming up. This is your host, Gabe Marushka with the Nomad Solopreneur Show. Until next week, Pura Vida!